Hi, my name is Tim Chan, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the closing ceremony of a data competition that started on October 15th. I'm even more thrilled that this is taking place right here at DevFest 2019. Today, I will announce the winner of that competition, which has a pretty cool prize. But before I do that, I'd like to tell you about the story behind Untapped Energy, the group that is running this competition, and how it's using a different way of working to help reshape the data culture in Calgary. Untapped Energy is a group of people who are all somehow connected to the energy industry here in Calgary, all who touch data in one form or another, and who are passionate about solving problems and creating innovation for this industry. More than just a collection of data experiences, this community is about using a growth mindset where everyone is job title neutral, willing to chip in wherever they can, and where everyone belongs. So Untapped Energy started by organizing a datathon, a weekend long event where participants came together to learn about industry specific challenges, to self select themselves into teams, and then to work with data sets to come up with new insights and innovations. From there, this group now meets monthly to hear about how data and analytics is making headways across the industry. We have different community building events. You may have heard of human centered design as a very popular philosophy towards problem solving. Well, we've created craft beer centered design. And not surprisingly, there have been some very interesting ideas that emerge when you're partnering that with exploring some really tasty local beers. Additionally, this community does data and analytics project development as, and is an advocate for open data culture. And another thing that we do is hack. You all know what a hack is. It's that thing that you do when you find a better way, like discovering a route that takes you from work to home that is a few minutes shorter, or a different way of resequencing your workflow that is smoother. And you know that feeling when you've hacked it well. It feels pretty good. Without thinking about it, you have followed the framework for doing a hack. You notice that something just doesn't sit well with you, consciously or subconsciously. And it is this irritation that motivates you to find a crack in the norm, a, a small rip where you can see a better outcome just on the other side. And that's when the creative juices start flowing. Your tinkering inner self gets activated and you start meddling with how things are currently being done, even if it's only in your head. Eventually, you get to an aha moment. It could be a slight tweak or a significant overhaul, and presto, you have hatched the perfect hack. You try again just to prove to yourself that it wasn't luck, and when you're sure that it is a good hack, then you share it. And it's not that you blab your hack to everyone, but because you are typically part of a broader ecosystem or community, your hack could inspire others to make their own tweaks, which then further enhances or augments your process. And so on and so on goes the cycle of constant improvement. But it all started with your hack. And so we foster this hack culture within the untapped energy group, encouraging folks to bring all of their experiences and creativity to think of different ways for doing better. So why don't we do a hack right now? So if you're given the problem to try to solve 65 times 65 without using a device, how long would it take you? Well, it's been about five seconds since you've been presented with this problem. Has anyone solved it yet? Well, the answer is 4,225. If you're like me, you'd still probably be working on it. I'd be thinking that it's doable enough that I could probably do it in my head but I'd be more comfortable if I was given a piece of paper and a pencil. I would then proceed to draw out something that looks like this. And it would probably take about one to two minutes to write it out, and I'd still get the answer, 4,225. So, how do we hack this? Well, some people much smarter than me figured out that there's an algebraic relationship that helps to make it possible to solve this problem much quicker. If we're to take the last two digits, so five in this case, multiply them together, we get 25, which is the last two numbers of the answer. Then if we take the first number, in this case, the six, multiply it by one number greater than that, or seven, we get 42. 
And that represents the first part of the answer. And there you have it, 4,225. So imagine doing that for the entire weekend with 120 other people and you were provided with a data set related to the oil and gas industry. And you were asked to hack new insights or innovation. Well, that's what happened at the very first hackathon or datathon for oil and gas last October at the Bow Valley College. And it didn't matter if you were a junior analyst or a VP, everyone got around the same table and found a way to play a part, bringing the best of their backgrounds, their different ways of thinking, and even their cool math tricks. The datathon looked at challenges and opportunities related to the areas of aging infrastructure, corporate social license, health and safety, the geothermal repurposing of old wells, and new business models. At the end of the weekend, five different teams, and they were all self-selected, presented their findings and produced a white paper each. More importantly, they built friendships that were lasting. And I'm not sure if you caught it in the video, uh, but there was also karaoke at this event as well. People who attended that data fund left feeling with a sense of accomplishment, feeling wonderful because of the new friendships that they were made and feeling hungry. Can we do this again? We also wish that there was a bit more time to understand the data and that the challenges were a bit more focused. And so this is how the 2019 Reclaim Data Competition was born. This competition kicked off just over a month ago on October 15th and is concluding today here at DevFest. We did end up making the challenge a little bit more focused, looking specifically at the inactive wells of this province's aging infrastructure to determine which ones would be ideal for abandoning. So it's been a little bit more than a month and now you get to witness the conclusion in a few moments. The competition was set up to test not only a competitor's ability to complete a machine learning exercise, but to demonstrate the understanding of what the data means and how it can be applied to solve the challenge. In other words, the evaluation criteria consisted of both a quantitative component as well as a qualitative part. The timelines you see were built around this evaluation criteria. Alberta is dealing with the challenge of wells sitting idle, where once they were actively producing oil. Wells no longer viable and need to be properly closed off and the grounds surrounding the wells need to be reclaimed to a point where any contamination is cleaned up. With the sustained economic downturn, many companies are going bankrupt before these idle wells are cleaned up, leaving them orphaned and the rest of us on the hook to pay for them. And the Alberta Energy Regulator does a great job explaining this in more details. Watch this. Producing Alberta's energy resources comes with the responsibility of returning the land to its natural state once the coal, oil, gas and bitumen has been removed. Energy development has been occurring in Alberta for over 100 years, and for nearly that long, aging infrastructure has been a reality in this province. In Alberta, when wells are no longer needed for producing oil and gas, companies abandon the wells. This doesn't mean that the company has walked away from the well. Instead, it means they have plugged the well down hole and left it in a long-term state which is safe and secure. The well is typically cut one to two meters below ground so that it is no longer visible from surface. Even though abandoned wells may no longer be visible from surface, anyone can find the location of these wells using the AER's Abandoned Well Viewer available on our website. Companies are responsible for returning the land to its natural state, comparable to what it was before the well was drilled. Until a well has been properly abandoned and the site has been reclaimed, the land cannot be reused. For example, a farmer cannot grow crops and a city cannot develop into that area. When the company has finished all its work, they apply to the Alberta Energy Regulator for a reclamation certificate. Companies are always responsible for dealing with any contamination that may have been left behind or for repairing abandoned wells that may have begun to leak. But sometimes the companies who own the well go out of business, 
If this happens, the AER orders anyone that had any interest in the well to abandon and reclaim it. If there is no responsible party, the AER considers this well and the site orphaned. The Orphan Well Association then takes over care and custody of it. The Orphan Well Association is industry funded and ensures that Albertans do not have to pay to abandon and reclaim any wells, facilities or pipelines. Aging energy infrastructure is a complex issue. The entire world wrestles with the same challenges we face. We must ensure we continue to address the issue. Solving a problem can't be done in isolation. In fact, it takes a village worth of effort to understand the problem, to find the data that might support new insights, to have the brain power and research to come up with new approaches and theories. For the 2019 Reclaim Data Competition, there are many important allies that came together to make this happen. And one special alliance developed quite recently, that being between Untapped Energy and the Calgary Google Developer Group. It was always envisioned that this data competition would be enhanced through a pre-competition workout, a boot camp if you'd like, where those getting ready to join the competition would get a chance to warm up their data muscles. It just so happened that there was a study jam on the topic of data, AI, machine learning that was being planned for just before when the data competition was supposed to kick off. So what a great opportunity to hatch a collaboration between the two groups. At the end, over 80 people showed up for this study jam. And what competition would be without prizes? There's something about a competitive environment that brings out the best potential in people. I don't know, perhaps this is just how the spe species has survived. But unlike other similar data competitions where there's a monetary prize, Untapped Energy worked with one of the city's top multi-award winning tech recruiting firms, ITIQ, to come up with an even more awesome prize. The winner gets an exclusive meeting with senior leadership from one of its top clients. So how cool is that? You get a meeting with someone who's looking to hire for a specific data skill set, and you kick off the discussion by sharing how you just beat out everyone to win a data competition. To keep things fresh, there were also some mid-competition prizes. So congratulations to competitors Brianna Taylor and Ben Salak for each winning a $100 Amazon gift card. As mentioned, the competition consisted of both a quantitative challenge and a qualitative challenge. The quantitative challenge actually consisted of two machine learning exercises, a classification clustering challenge and a re regression challenge. At this stage of the competition, we had over 50 people participate. We hosted this part of the competition on an open source platform called CodaLab, which allowed competitors to make multiple submissions and to better their standing on the running leaderboard. In the classification challenge, competitors were tasked with training a machine learning process to identify the status of a well, given a set of characteristics from its operating profile. In the regression challenge, competitors were tasked with training a process to predict the initial production of a given well. In both cases, competitors were evaluated according to the F1 score of their submitted model. But with the way that evaluation criteria is set up, it really is up to the qualitative challenge to help determine the winner. So I invite you now to take a look at the three finalists in the 2019 Reclaim Data Competition. After this, we will find out who the winner is. Hello, I use Python for solving this challenge and first what I did was converting all the features with dates like confidential release date, spot date, surface abandon date and re-release date to zero and ones, zero for null and one for the road that have a date and by exploring the surface abandoned date, it was obvious that most of the rows with the surface abandoned date have been abandoned, so I think that was a good predictor. So then I used the Lahey class feature and changed uh, and group some of the values to uh, 
a bigger group like development or wildcat or, and things and also for the well, stand, well type standardized I, I did the same because there was a lot lot of unique values in these columns and for the model it was not easy to deal with all these values it was caused a lot of features for the model to deal with so for the fracture stages I just filled in lots of numbers and I used uh, Pearson correlation to find the correlation between the predictors and the target and it was obvious that the surface abandon date has minus 0.6 correlation with the with the status code and also uh, the rig release date has 0.22 and another one was kernel operation ID which has a 0.37 correlation with the well stats code so these were the uh, features with the large correlation high correlation with the target and also uh, for the to taking into con consideration the Douglas severity and uh, the horizontal leg length I divided M MD feature by the TVD to get a new feature like MD over TVD and the higher the MD over TVD shows that we have a lo longer horizontal length or lo high inclination or azimuth maybe we, we can understand from that so these are the features that I have used for my classification uh, algorithm or model and this I, I first uh, one had encoding for the for the categorical features and then uh, use this EPA set ideas to index and then the feature scaling and then I run different models like random forest which was the best model for me this is the confusion matrix and uh, I got 88% if one score for the train model and for the validation I got 82% so 82% of one score from the random forest for the logistic regression the numbers was lower for about 74% and decision theory also gives 88% 82% something something similar to the random forest and for the naive based I got very low number 57 and also I used light GBM I got high numbers like 82% so for the regression as the number of rows in the Viking file was small look smaller than the training I do a merge and I do imputing and change with not a number not the numbers in the oil and gas and water with zeros and other things so I plot histograms for the data file and do the same grouping for the light class and things and I used uh, three different models for each of the oil, gas, and water production. Use different parameters for that. So I do some data cleaning and do one hundred encoding and things. And then I fit multiple linear regression, which this is the R squared and mean absolute errors that I get for training it. And I run it for the, all the third models. Also, I do stepwise regression to. Uh, to just use adjust the R square and R square and compare them to see which ones are not increasing adjusted R square. So I fit polynomial regression model also also fitting decision tree model, which I got better results. You know, higher R squares you can see uh, some of them are minus. So and the random forest regression. So I and this we are. Hi, my name is Rohul Jadeep, and I'm going to talk a bit about the models I used in the Untapped Energy Reclaim Data Competition. The models I submitted to both the Regression and Classification Challenge were XGBoost models. And these models had uh, quite a few advantages, uh, with the first one being obviously they perform better on the leaderboards than uh, models I had submitted using random forest and neural nets. Another big advantage, and this is an advantage of uh, tree-based 
models is that it's very interpretable. Even though the tree may itself may be very complex, you can go down the nodes of the trees and see exactly how the tree makes a prediction. And that's very interpretable to humans because it's just a bunch of if statements. And furthermore, you can use uh, what you observe on the tree and uh, features such as feature importance to confirm uh, inclinations you had about the wells, such as what was the most important factor, or you can uh, relate it back to the engineering of the well, uh, as well as maybe the physical properties of the well. So you can see that it really helps uh, our knowledge of the well expand because it basically categorizes how the well behaves or what's very important to the well. Uh, compared to neural nets, where it's a lot of activation functions and it really can obscure what's actually happening. Yes, it can make a good prediction, but it's tough to see why or how what's influencing that prediction. So I think that's one main advantage of using uh, XGBoost models. Another advantage is uh, some of the feature engineering I did on the models or the data. And so, first of all, I removed a lot of data I thought was su superfluous or uh, unneeded or had a lot of um, blanks. And so that helps with preventing overfitting. In addition, I added a, very, uh, a feature such as the difference, the time difference between the last reported, uh, uh, the last report on the well versus when the well was finally completed, and so and that was in the top 40 in feature importance. So you can see it actually had an influence on how we predict the model. In addition to that, uh, the most important feature from feature uh, ranking by feature importance was the surface abandonment date, and there I transformed that into a variable, into a binary variable, uh, telling you whether the surface abandonment date had been reported or not, and that pro proved to be very critical in the model making decision. So that's uh, a few advantages of the model. A few disadvantages of the model were, uh, especially for the regression, there wasn't that much data, so the prediction wasn't that good. And I think so one thing I could improve on the model is maybe reducing the number of trees in the model, as well as perhaps reducing pre-depth, and this could prevent overfitting and helping the model generalize better on a smaller data set. Another disadvantage of the model is that uh, the surface abandonment date had had a much higher feature importance. And while that's okay for the competition, for a company uh, or an industrial model, that's a bit too on the nose because that literally tells you why do you need the model if, if you're being told it's been abandoned. And so I think maybe next time I could remove that feature and train again to try to get a model that can predict without that and be a better generalized model. And uh, speaking of how how this model applies to industry, I, I think this model can, uh, these models I use have, can be very beneficial because, uh, because for example, maybe companies know whether the well is abandoned or not. And so maybe they don't need to make a prediction on that. And eventually all wells will become abandoned. But thinking about it, uh, it would be very nice for a company to be able to predict how long the well would be active, active for. So for example, if you have the classification of the well, maybe you can use that in conjunction with the other data to, uh, to make a prediction. And we can see, for example, in feature importance, uh, a lot of the data that uh, was important to the uh, model was the well type, whether it was a commingled well or a horizontal well or an oil well or a gas well. And so we can use those features to maybe predict uh, how the, uh, the max production or the, or how long it will remain active, and I think this is very important to oil companies. So, and especially the regression too. It's of course it's very important to know how the well uh, based on, and we could. Uh, it's very important to know how the well will perform based on the data we had, such as its location, its formation, and we could even add more data. Uh, maybe specifically, I have a reservoir engineering background, so maybe specifically adding the viscosity of the oil. Uh, in the reservoir and more characteristics like that. So I see a lot of potential for these models to help uh, oil and gas companies know how to uh, effectively spend their resources uh, where they should drill wells in order to benefit the benefit their company. Thank you. Hello, my name is Volodymyr, uh, and me and Anton together are a part of an Eastern Bloc team. Hello, I'm Anton, and this is our attempt to make sense out of the models and discuss their life after the leaderboard score chasing. As you guys did a, as you guys did a good job covering the basics of the data set, we'll jump over to describing our approach to both of the challenges. 
Let's talk about the modeling approach now. In the quantitative part of the challenge, we need to solve two problems. Build a regression model for well's initial production rate and build a classifier that can decide whether well was labeled as abandoned, suspended, or active. Let's start with regression. In the simplest example of multivariable regression, we would like to find an equation that expresses our target in this IP in this case as a linear function of variables we are provided, such as completions, geological variables, and others. The coefficients alpha in front of each variable is what a computer needs to find using ground truth information provided, that is a data set with the real production numbers. A next step further would be to recognize that a relationship between IPs and captured variables might be complex and nonlinear. In that case, we would like to find, to find a function f that is in some way relates our input variables to the target, and we can call that a black box, which we will try to open later. For classification, the situation is very similar, however, instead of IPs, our target now is the probability of a well to be labeled as abandoned, suspended, or active. Our cyclical modeling approach started with analyzing input features and target and determined variables that should provide higher and or lower predictive power. We then used domain expertise to come up with the new features and transform the target appropriately. We then trained a model, analyzed residuals and feature importance, and then repeated the process with a few adjustments import, informed by this analysis. We also noticed that neither geo nor completion variables were present in the dataset, hence we came up with proxies for them using dates, location, and other variables. Specifically, a spot date is a good tracker for the historic trends in Max BOE that is likely caused by historically increasing property and well length values in the area and tend to have a strong influence on well's performance. On target transform, well IP's distribution have long tails, much like rainfall or earthquake magnitudes. Which will, which will cause problems when trained on IP values as is. The explanation is here. Therefore, we resolve this problem by switching to the logarithm of the target. For classification, no target transform was necessary. However, a problem with the classification is that the balance of classes is time dependent. Obviously, when a field is in early development, none of the wells are abandoned, and vice versa. When a field is really old with no activity, then most of the wells will be abandoned. Therefore, the model trained on a random sample over time will have very questionable forecasting abilities. An important note, for the model to be useful in practice, it should be trained in a reality reflecting scenario. That is, if the data has a temporary character, for example, spot data of the real test data is only increasing together with the other features potential. The cross-validation technique employed should, ref should reflect that it should not be a simple random split. Moreover, wells are not drilled in a random pattern in time and space. EMP companies tend to develop areas economical at a given time price of commodity. For both regression and classification, our model was an ensemble of gradient boosted trees. Its light GBM implementation benefits from a highly efficient C++ backbone code that makes it a great candidate for quick experimentation. We then trained a model and looked at residual plots to identify samples of higher errors for further analyses. Naturally, we would like to know which features our model identifies as more important, so we use shop package to estimate and visualize importances. For regression, this plot shows features in the order of decreasing importance. Max BE is a top feature due to the fact that it obviously leaks the target. That is, it's strongly correlated to the target values, however, it is not available in the reality. We simply do not know Max BOE prior to drilling, much like IP. Among other strong features are obviously the location of the well, light and long, which maps the rock quality and geological features, and its vintage um, spot date that most likely maps completions features. Similar to regression, features for classification, shown here in the order of decreasing importance, and their impact on the particular class probability, shown by a colored bar. A brief examination of the feature importance plot and the probability dependency plots for each of the class may help understand how a model makes a decision. For example, non a max BOE suggests that a well is still active, most likely because a number is available for later spot date wells. The closer time difference between a surf abandoned date and a status date is to zero, the more likely that a well is abandoned. There is no more status updates after well is abandoned indeed. For some operators, uh, which corresponds to certain values in current operator parent uh, feature, the game of drilling in the Viking Basin is over, as you might see by the elevated chances of wells being abandoned if they belong to those operators. Finally, a few quick notes on the future usability of the models. For regression, high-scoring models rely heavily on max BOE. 
and we are afraid there is no much practical use, as max BOE is not available at the time when IP prediction is desired. However, if max BOE was to be eliminated and some completions geology, add up, ge geology data was added, then a similar modeling procedure could be used in evaluating reserves and impact on production caused by various completions practices. From a risk point of view, one could apply this model in a step off uh, or a clustered matter and identify geographic area zones where predictions are re less reliable. Example is given here. Rest less reliable areas could be loosely defined as those characterized with high error in predictions. Those areas can be then marked as risky and could be given a higher discount when economical analysis is performed. And then in classification, uh, sim similar to regression, the models that score high in this competition are quite useless since they directly uh, use leaking proxies for the target, such as surf abandon date. If that feature was to be eliminated, then the model ends up relying on an operator and their historical activity in the region. We're still facing a problem of a model having no predict in the future capabilities, since the data set in its current form is rather static, such as none of the columns are time dependent. However, if the data set had time dependent features, for example, days um, since a closure event or days in production, in the last year. It would be interesting to develop a model that predicts days to abandonment. We could get the probabilities of a well to be abandoned in the next n months. The main value here is to have this probability change over time, thus allowing the user to quickly identify areas where a large population is likely to be abandoned. And so, the moment that we've all been waiting for, well, at least I've been waiting for this, the winner of the 2019 Reclaim Data Competition is Team Eastern Bloc, Anton and Volodymyr. So thank you for allowing Untapped Energy to be a part of your DevFest experience. I would like to personally invite you to check out our community. You are always welcome. Our next meetup is on Tuesday, December 10th at 5.30 p.m. at Suncor. The topic is Deconstructing Data Science. You can register using the various jump points on the screen. Consider at least joining our meetup group so that you can stay informed on all of our events, including the craft beer center design ones. And always check out our website at untappedenergy.ca. And finally, again, thank you to all of our allies for making this community awesome.